Hello and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. In a previous video, we talked about the uprisings of Irish American coal workers during the long strike, followed by the horror of Black Thursday. In that video, we discussed some of the murders of company scum that prompted the hanging of 19 men, even though there was nothing for the murders or atrocities acted upon or against the Irish over a decade of coal mining. Unfortunately, there was one lawful man who was murdered in a truly cold-blooded event, and although his name was known, there was no funeral, and the location of his burial was lost for 124 years. Welcome to the last spot that a simple patrolman stood before having his life brutally taken away. See you in a minute. During the years of Irish immigration to the United States, there was a need and a call in 1862 albeit not legally ratified until 1863, for the conscription of military personnel through the National Conscription Act, a law authorizing the draft of men for a nine-month period of service in the Civil War, which had started in 1861. Now, it may not seem important in the overall scheme, but I bring it up because that is when the actual name of the Molly Maguires had first been kicked up in the States. You see, Although the ancient order of Hibernians was acting on behalf of coal workers for better work conditions, and although the Molly Maguires, if they existed, may have been using the AOH as a front, the fact remains that their ideology of not being told what to do by the man was already in full effect and an at least secondary consideration, if not the primary consideration, for leaving UK-controlled Ireland. So the concept of coming to America and then being immediately conscripted for the man's war was just something not very high up on their list of things in which to participate. So when the conscription came through Schuylkill County, specifically Cass Township, there were those who were open and understanding of the conscription, like Benjamin Franklin Yost, and those who opposed it secretly, like most of the coal-working Irish, as well as the U.S. military's very own Colonel Alexander Kelly McClure. Yeah, good old A.K. McClure, a Lincoln Republican who rallied support for the Civil War as chairman of the Senate Committee of Military Affairs and ambassador to the loyal war governors of the North who met in Altoona to secure continued support for the war. Although he grew up in Perry County, being a member of the ancient order of Hibernians and coming from Celtic Catholic Irish roots, was strong enough that during the time of conscription in Schuylkill County, as the overseer of the Commonwealth's drafts, he allegedly worked with those of the secret organization known as the Molly Maguires to secure enough fictitious affidavits in the county to make it look like the war quota for that area had been met. That way, the Irish didn't have to go to war. Benjamin Franklin Yost was not so lucky and was drafted into the Army of the North in the end of 1862. He served his time in the war and came out returning to his home to become a policeman for the Tamaqua Borough Police Department. It's important to note he was not a policeman of a coal mine or any organization wrapped up in these disputes of the coal workers, but he was a policeman of the borough who had to keep the citizens in line as the Molly Maguires ran night raids and posted threats to local denizens. That is what makes Ben different than many of the others in this area during that time. He was not Irish. He was not a part of a colliery. He was just a simple borough policeman. And as of this date, he is the only police officer to die in the line of duty in the history of Tamaqua. I know we touched on the evil of the coal mines during this time, but honestly, it probably would have sorted itself out during the long strike if it was not for the evil empire of the railroads. What's that? Oh, you thought the coal mine issue was due to coal and colliery or maybe even to steel industries? No, not at all. It was not until the involvement of the private interest groups and the Pinkerton Private Military Detective Agency that things went downhill quickly and became a run of murders of higher-ups who couldn't handle the local constituents. I mean, what better way to control the narrative than to take out those who could point out all of the bad things you're doing to your workers and the orders you are given to carry out to make sure it always looks like an accident. I know, sounds like a conspiracy, 
But like I always tell you, I find the best parts of the history by following the money. And as bad as the disdain of the workers may have seemed, it did not get really bad until Robert Barron and president of the Reading Railroad, Franklin B. Gowan, implemented his plan from back in 1871 to eliminate any discord or activism by workers and make sure they knew who was in control. This did not play out until 1875 when Gowan brought in the Pinkertons. A common theme develops in Pennsylvania Railroad history when it comes to the mighty work of the Irish and their subsequent slaughters, wouldn't you say? Back to Ben and why we stopped to check out this location. Ben was on foot patrol and was in the process of performing one of his common morning duties, which was to extinguish a street light. It is asserted that Ben was targeted due to his arrest and possible abuse of an alleged member of the Molly Maguires, and, in retaliation, was shot on June 6th of 1875 in broad daylight by a 32 caliber while extinguishing the lamp. It is not listed who the alleged perpetrator or of what crime was originally committed that initiated this patrolman to be put on a hit list for this secret organization. As a matter of fact, there's nothing more than information within the Pinkerton reports, which are clad in disinformation and redaction, to the hit on Ben truly being related to any of the allegations reported. In the end, the ultimate price was paid by James Jimmy Boyle, James Carroll, Thomas Duffy, Hugh McGeehan, and James Rorty, whom were all hanged on Black Thursday, June 21, 1877, at the Carbon County Jail in Mouse Chunk, now known as Jim Thorpe. As for the sad tale of Benjamin Franklin Yost, well, his death went without public information disclosure when it came to telling of his day, time, or location for the funeral. As a matter of fact, he was not even buried until more than a month after his death. That's right, similar to the tale of Philip Duffy of the infamous Duffy's Cut in Malvern, Pennsylvania. The gravesite of Ben remained unmarked and unknown for 124 years out of fear of retribution from the local labor groups. That was until 1999 when the local Oddfellow Cemetery caretaker realized where his body was interred. Through his knowledge of who was in the cemetery and where they all were in conjunction of knowing the terrain of the cemetery, the caretaker was able to identify an unmarked grave as that of Benjamin Franklin Yost. The determination was made based on a depression found next to a man of the Shep family within the Shep family lot. This man was none other than Ben's financially well-to-do brother-in-law, Daniel Shep. This finding was followed by the donation and volunteering of people to mark his site with a headstone. The caretaker identified that he has worked at the cemetery for over a dozen years and digging through the paperwork as well as knowing when you are standing at a disturbed ground grave gave him the insight to two possible locations, both within the Shep family plot. Although the records do not list his plot, they do identify his name, date of burial as August and reason for death, assassinated. This is where it gets a little more interesting. When digging into the history of Daniel Shep's possible involvement with the interment of his brother-in-law, Ben, we find the person who commissioned the infamous Kelly the Bum Spy of the Pinkertons. It was Shep who contacted the Pinkertons alongside of the request by Gowan to have someone come in and investigate the murder of his brother-in-law by infiltrating the Molly Maguires. Well, I'm inclined to believe that keeping this burial a secret was probably in the best interest of Daniel Shep and his family. More than people desecrating a gravesite, the amount of harassment, if not total retaliation by the local Irish against the Shep family for their use of the Pinkertons would frighten me enough to not want anyone to know anything about what I had done. It was on June 19th of 1999 during the Tamaqua Summerfest, 124 years after his death, that a reenactment of a time period accurate funeral procession complete with a horse-drawn hearse traveled up West Broad Street to the Oddfellow Cemetery to dedicate this headstone. 
For more information on similarly odd sights to see in Irish history, check out this video here. As always, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.